We are so delighted you all could join us for this year's Cohen Lecture. As you know, the law school established this lecture to honor a distinguished speaker and have had many of the leading lights in law and the academy over the last several decades, from Anthony Scalia to Richard Posner to Ronald Dworkin. We today may be breaking new ground in that our lecturer is not a trained lawyer. He had been admitted to and deferred his admission to Harvard Law School over a period of years after he had gotten a PhD in anthropology, but he hooked up with a lawyer and they wrote a book. And it was one of those few books that changed the world. Um, it certainly changed my life when I was uh, in college in the 80s. I was told by someone you need to read this book and it was a revelation. The book, Getting to Yes, um, has had, I don't know how many millions of copies that it's sold. I think it's up to eight million copies, which for a book is astonishing. Translated in 30 languages, and it has uh, really held the test of time. And the ways in which it affects thinking about negotiation goes from the um, small interpersonal relationships to international conflict. And indeed, uh, Bill Urey has been involved in lots of international conflict resolution. And appropriate for tonight, um, he has taken on a very innovative project which is called the Abraham Path Initiative that seeks to build bridges between different cultures and faiths in the Middle East and create a path that was walked by Abraham and the um, civilizations that descend from Abraham. In some sense, this is perfect for tonight because people of the Jewish faith tonight will ask why is tonight different from all other nights as they have a Passover Seder. And we all will have the intellectual and spiritual food for thought of Bill Urey's um, really remarkable career reflections starting off with this great project. He'll talk for about 40 minutes, then we'll have some questions. Um, with no further ado, Dr. William Urey. Well, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here, to be able to speak, and I'm thankful to Phil for the invitation to give this lecture. Uh, it's a particular pleasure uh, because it's now been about 33 years since I was privileged to work with Roger Fisher on getting to yes. And I was just remembering this morning a little known fact that when, when Roger and I worked on getting yes, we had an early draft in 1980 and we tried out the draft in two law schools, two law classes. One was at Harvard in an experimental class on negotiation uh, given by Roger Fisher, and the other one was here at CU Law School in a class given by Mike Wheeler. And so that actually provided us the feedback then to, for the final draft of Getting to Yes. So it's, it's fitting that, uh, that I'd be here to talk about Getting to Yes you know, 30 years later. Um, I'd like to begin, if I may, by acknowledging uh, my enormous debt to Roger Fisher, uh, who passed away a year and a half ago, and who was my mentor uh, and introduced me to the field of negotiation mediation, and who was a, a giant in the field. So I, I feel very, very grateful to have had that opportunity to work with Roger. In this talk, what I'd like to do is to offer some reflections on what I've observed as a, as a student and practitioner of negotiation mediation over the last 30 years, and to offer some thoughts about what I've noticed are perhaps the principal challenges to success in getting to yes, and therefore what I wish I had known back 30 years ago when I was a student, or 35 years ago when I was a student, and what I wish that law students might have the chance, the opportunity to learn today, to be effective negotiators for the future. So over the last three decades, I've had the privilege of having a front row seat on a quiet revolution that's been taking place around the world. It's a revolution that accompanies the knowledge revolution. It's a revolution really in the way in which we as human beings, our organizations, 
our governments, our societies, the world itself, the way in which we make decisions. Because traditionally, a generation or two ago, the, the most dominant form of making decisions tended to be top-down, tended to be people at the top of the hierarchies of power uh, make the decisions and the people on the bottom follow them. There were exceptions, of course, but that was kind of the, the general way. And over the last couple of generations, there's been a gradual shift from vertical decision-making as the primary form of decision-making to horizontal decision-making. And another name for horizontal decision-making is negotiation. I mean, if you, I, I invite you to think about your own lives for a moment. If I were to define negotiation very simply and very broadly as back and forth communication, you're trying to reach agreement with the other side. You may have some interests which are in tension with each other. You may have other interests which are, which are shared, like an ongoing relationship. If you think about it in the broad sense of the term, let me ask you just, if I may, just a couple of questions about your own experience as negotiators. Who do you find yourself negotiating with in the course of your day? You wouldn't mind calling it out. Who do you negotiate with? My children. Your children, okay. Start with the difficult ones. <laughs> Who else? My supervisor. Your supervisor. My colleagues. Your colleagues. Parents. Your parents? Yeah, your parents. Myself. Yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, there we go. So if you were to just make a ballpark estimate of how much time you think you spend engaged, broadly speaking, in back and forth communication with your, you know, at home, with your kids, your parents, your spouse, at work with colleagues, co-workers, supervisors, uh, employers, uh, and so on, with buyers, with clients, with, with, with suppliers, with whoever. How much of your time, if you had to make a broad estimate, do you spend engaged, broadly speaking, in the act of back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement, something that we might broadly define as negotiation? What would you say? What percentage? 80%, okay. How many would say it's at least a quarter of my time, just out of curiosity, okay, at least a quarter. Keep your hands up if it's over 50%, okay. Over 75%. So, you know, whether it's 25% or 50% or 80%, it's, it's, it's a huge portion of our time. We may not always think of it formally as negotiation. Getting the yes begins with the phrase that like it or not, you are a negotiator. And I think that was, you know, fairly new, you know, 33 years ago, it was fairly new, but now I think people begin to realize that you know, we're negotiating from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. And uh, let me ask you, if you think about the last 10 years of your life, would you say that the amount of negotiating that you're doing is staying pretty much the same as it say, was five or 10 years ago? Would you say that it's, it's going down over time or would you say it's going up? What would you say? Go, how many would say it's going up? Okay, very, now that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's the negotiation revolution and it's happening. I, I travel around the world a lot and it's happening in every single country around the world. Slowly, more gradually in some places, faster in others. But it's happening and, and the internet is speeding it up uh, because the internet tends to flatten organizations. I mean, if you think about how to get your, you know, get your work done nowadays in the workplace, your job done, we are literally dependent on dozens, hundreds, perhaps thousands of individuals and organizations over whom we exercise no direct control. To get what we need, to get what we want, we're, we're compelled to negotiate. And when Roger and I were working on getting to yes, negotiation, I would say on the whole, tended to have a rather adversarial connotation. The, perhaps the two most popular books at the time on negotiation uh, back in the, uh, around 1980 were, one was called Winning by Intimidation, <laughs> and the second one was called Looking Out for Number One. <laughs> and so, you know, getting to yes came out as kind of a, a little bit counter to that cultural trend, uh, and the idea that both sides actually could benefit uh, in a dispute or a deal, you know, was foreign to a lot of people, that the, the idea that there could be mutual gain. And back then, in 1980, there were very, very few courses given on negotiation. Uh, now I would imagine that in almost in every law school, in almost any law school here in this country and perhaps around the world, negotiation is now taught. The same is true in schools of business, schools of government. 
Negotiation is even beginning to be taught in primary schools and secondary schools and so on. So the negotiation revolution is in full sway and I take heart that you know the, the common sense tenets of getting to yes, which Roger and I codified uh, in those days uh, in that book were, you know, they've, they've spread far and wide. I mean, as, as uh, Dean Weiser mentioned, uh, I think the numbers, I checked the numbers with the publisher uh, and with our colleague Bruce Patton a few, few, uh, few, few weeks ago, and it's up to like 10 million copies in this country alone. And the term even getting to yes, which didn't exist before the book has become a kind of, you know, it's used in like, I see it sometimes in editorials in the New York Times with no reference to the book. It's just used as a kind of common phrase for negotiation. That's the good news. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, the, new, the other news is that as much progress has been made, the work of getting to yes is very, very much far from being done. I mean, if you look at today's newspaper for a moment, as I did, like today's New York Times, you see escalating civil political conflict in the Ukraine, the United States and Russia at loggerheads, talk of a possible new Cold War, you see gridlock between Democrats and Republicans in Washington on everything from health care to debt to energy. You see a warning from the world scientists of unpredictable consequences for humanity unless the world's governments can get to yes on vital action to be taken on the issue of climate change. And it goes on. I've spent the last uh, th three, th almost four decades working on some of the world's most intractable conflicts because I was interested, I'm interested not just in writing, but in testing out these ideas to see how they work, where they don't work, why they don't work, and so on. Uh, working in a wide variety of situations from the Cold War between the United States and the former Soviet Union, you know, bitter labor strikes in coal mines where I worked as a mediator and an arbitrator, boardroom battles, family feuds, a whole variety of situations, and I've personally witnessed how challenging it actually can be for people, for organizations, for societies to get to yes, but also how even often in the face of apparent great difficulty, these challenges can be overcome. And I'd like to just share with you just one example, a very recent example for me where I've been working in, in recent months on a business legal dispute uh, that the Financial Times called one of the biggest cross-continental boardroom showdowns in history. Uh, this was a conflict, this is a conflict between uh, my client who is uh, a Brazilian uh, entrepreneur and a French entrepreneur. And uh, it's a struggle over the, it was a struggle over the control of a company major, major company with 150,000 employees. Uh, the costs of the conflict were enormous. Uh, each side was spending millions of dollars in legal fees. Uh, there were countless personal attacks in the press. Uh, the employees were feeling very, obviously, strained. It wasn't helping the company at all. Uh, divided loyalties. It was even had come up at the presidential level between France and Brazil. Uh, straining commercial ties. It had been going on, this dispute, for about two and a half years and was expected to go on widely for another eight years until my client stepped down from the board. Uh, in this conflict, you know, there were three areas or three challenges that I think make it difficult to get to yes. Uh, the first challenge actually has to do with understanding ourselves. Uh, it's not easy for us to understand, to, as someone said, you know, I said, who do you get to yes with? Myself, you know, that's actually could be one of the hardest tasks, and in this case, it certainly was. My client, for example, was unsure what he really wanted. Did he want to carry on a fight for, you know, for the foreseeable future, for years to come, or did he want to seek a settlement? The second challenge actually has to do with understanding the other. In this particular case, for example, my client felt highly disrespected by his former erstwhile business partner, and I'm sure the other party did as well. Uh, it is really difficult for us to understand other human beings. We are very quick to judge and to blame. Um, 
just witness right now, for example, what's going on between the United States and Russia. We're very quick to blame the Russians, judge them immediately, uh, without having really sought to understand what it is actually like to be in their shoes right now. How could they see the situation? Uh, and the third challenge is, has to do with understanding the game, the, the nature of the game, of the interaction between both. In this particular, you know, the assumptions that we're making. In the particular case of this uh, Brazilian-French dispute, it was very much, the constru very much constructed as a win-lose contest. And there were, I would say, several, uh, there were at least a dozen law firms involved in this, in these, uh, in this dispute. Uh, there were two major arbitrations, a lawsuit. Uh, there were dozens of lawyers involved from New York, from Sao Paulo, from Paris, uh, even from the Middle East. Uh, I mean, from all over the world, it concentrated on this particular dispute. So that was the challenge. Uh, and on the other hand, just trying to apply some of the common sense principles that are in getting to yes and others that, you know, that are very much congruent with getting to yes. Um, I was invited in, I was brought in by uh, my client's wife and daughter who were very concerned about the, the health impacts, uh, just the stress impacts on, 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 on my client. And uh, so when it came to have a first meeting with the other side, uh, there had been a negotiation for about 18 months that had broken down, and by the time I got involved, there hadn't been any negotiations going on for about four or five months. And when I finally was able to get a meeting with the other side, it was with, uh, it was, it was with uh, the other side's, a friend of the other side who was his, his bank, it was his mentor, who was a very, very prominent French banker, who offered to have lunch with me in Paris at his customary restaurant. So I met with him. It was a Monday, in, first Monday in September. I flew over there and we had a lunch and he said, why are you here? And I said, because life is too short. <laughs> you know, life is too short for these kinds of conflicts, which are just so destructive in so many ways. And he nodded and he said, so how would you, how would you settle this kind of, how would you approach this kind of conflict? And I said, well, it seems to me there are two basic interests that both sides share here, two basic principles that we could perhaps agree upon. One is freedom. Both sides would like to be free to pursue their own lives and dreams and get out of this trap somehow of this conflict. And the second is dignity. Uh, and he nodded again, and uh, we, we talked for a while over lunch. Uh, some ideas about actually how to implement those two principles or interests of freedom and dignity. And then uh, he asked me when I was going back to the United States, and I said, oh, I'm going back tomorrow morning. And he said, fine. And then uh, asked me for my phone number. And anyway, a few hours later, I'm walking in the Jardin, Jardin Tuileries there in, in Paris, and I get a call from him, and he says, could you by any chance stay over the next day to meet with me? And I said, fine. We met the second day, um, sketched out a rough outline, very simple outline of how to settle this huge dispute. And uh, I flew that night to Brazil, met with my client. So that was a Tuesday, flew Tuesday night. By Friday, we had both men there in a law office in, in Sao Paulo, signing an agreement, ending this dispute shaking hands, uh, press conference, joint press release in which both men wished each other well, goodwill gestures on both sides, and, and an end to this conflict in a way that both men, I can honestly say, are deeply satisfied with. This was not just a compromise solution that each side kind of felt like they gave up. Uh, even it was a solution, too, that it was very hard for people, because this was very much in the press in Paris and in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and no one could figure out who won. No one, because there was, there was no numbers in the, in the agreement, hardly any numbers that you could say, wait a minute, why did he, did he give in here, did he give in there? It was a very simple agreement, ending a non-compete clause, shifting a billion dollars worth of stock, uh, 
with goodwill gestures on both sides, but it was, the conflict was, was, was basically over. And to me, it was just an example that this is just, this is not rocket science. This is simply the application of a number of core principles that uh, some taken from getting to yes, but principles too that I wish that I'd known when I was a student and that I wish that law students could learn today. And uh, let me just describe them, if I may. I mean, the, the first principle has to do with the fact that um, at least it's probably, probably the thing that's probably struck me most in my negotiation and mediation experience over the last three decades is that the greatest obstacle to our success in negotiation is not what we think it is. It is not the difficult person on the other side. It is not the difficult parties. Uh, it's actually right here. It's ourselves. It's in our own very human, very natural tendency to react. In other words, to act without thinking. As Ambrose Bierce once put it, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that happens more often than not, certainly happened in this particular uh, negotiation that I just described. Uh, you know, going essentially, to me, the, the foundation of successful negotiation is the ability to imagine that you're negotiating up here, say, on a stage here. And part of your mind goes to a mental and emotional balcony overlooking that stage, a place of perspective, a place of calm, a place of self-control, a place where you can keep your eyes on the prize, on what is truly most important to you. When I first met my client in that case I just described, I met with him in his home, and my question to him was, you know, tell me, what do you really want? What, what do you want here out of this, uh, you know, describe the whole conflict to me. What, what do you want? And he said, well, I want my stock and I want my freedom. Non I want my, you know, I, want, I don't want to non-compete. I want it from three years to nothing. And I want that company headquarters. He, you know, he gave me like five or six things. And then I said, but what do you really want? <laughs> I mean, what do you really want? I mean, you've got everything. You're, you know, you're a billionaire. You've got everything. You've got a family. You've got kids. You, you know, you've got life. You can do anything you want with your life. What do you really, really want? And he looked at me and he said, libertad, in other words, freedom. He wanted freedom. I said, OK, so if I come to work for you, that's going to be my only goal, is to get you that freedom. In other words, from the balcony there, keep your eyes on that prize. That's what I'm going to work for. I'm going to remind you of that every single time in this whole thing is that's my goal is to win you your freedom to go ahead be free to spend time with your family free to go do business deals fly around the world do whatever you want that's going to be what I work on and uh, and that's what I did and that's that is what's so hard I find to do in today's world today's world particularly with our cell phones and our texts and our emails uh, it is so easy and natural to react when you get an email from someone that you, you know, some colleague or at work or whatever it is, and, you know, it gets you upset because they left you out or something like that, it's so easy just to compose a quick reply, and it's so satisfying just to hit the reply button, or what's worse, to hit the reply all button, <laughs> and then it goes out to the entire group, and then you start to see conflicts and disputes start to escalate. There is a button on that screen which is very rarely used, which is the balcony button, which is save as draft. That's the button where you just compose it, you get it out of your system, then you know, everyone has their favorite techniques for going to the balcony or whatever. You go you know, work out, you go walk up in Chautauqua, you go you know, have a coffee with a friend. You, know, you have a night to sleep over. Then you think, what do I really want? What's really going to advance my interests, my goals, in this particular relationship or situation? And then you'll come back, you hit the delete button, and you'll Ideally, pick up the phone and arrange to meet with that person because, uh, you know, through email, you can't really communicate. Emails are very easy to, to uh, misread, a lot of miscommunication because there's, there's no context, there's no emotions. But even on the phone, it's much better because you, there's a tone of voice. So those are all ways of, of going to the balcony. Um, everyone has their favorite way. I remember once, many, some years ago, I was involved uh, as a third party in the political conflict that is still going on right now in the country of Venezuela. And uh, at one point in my 
work in Venezuela, which was about 10 years ago, I, I had a meeting with uh, President Chavez, Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela. And it was a time when there were a million people on the streets of Caracas demanding his resignation and a million people on the streets supporting him, the Chavistas and the anti-Chavistas. There was a, a time of high tension and there was a lot of concern in the international community that this could tip into a civil war. And uh, anyway, I, I, I'd had a, a couple of meetings with him and this time I went in to see him and he liked to meet at night. It was nine o'clock at night and, uh, and uh, I waited patiently. It was 9.30, 10, 10.30, 11, 11.30, midnight. Finally, I'm ushered in to see the president and, and he's, I expect to find him alone at that hour but he's actually got his entire cabinet arrayed behind him. So he said, uh, Yuri, he said, uh, tell me, uh, have a seat here. Tell me, how, how do you think the situation is here right now in Venezuela? How do you think the situation is? And I thought, well, you know, I said, I've, Mr. President, I've talked to some of your government ministers here, and I've talked to the other side, and it seems to me that they're making some progress. As soon as he heard that word, it was like that was his cue to explode, and he just, he just, he just said, what? Progress? Are you joking? You know, you, you're so foolish, you're not seeing everything that's going on, you're not seeing all the traitorous things the other side is doing. And he proceeded to shout at me, like, uh, very close to my face for approximately 30 minutes. <laughs> now, of course, you know, if you put yourself in my shoes, you know, the, you know, I'm thinking, oh, that's not right, I'm not naive, or we're not you know, you start to get a little defensive. And then I remembered, wait a minute, uh, you know, time to go to the balcony for a moment. Uh, and a friend of mine ta taught me a very simple little technique. He said, if you're ever in a tough situation, Bill, he said, uh, pinch the palm of your hand. And I said, Hernan, why would I pinch the palm of my hand? He said, oh, because it'll give you a temporary pain, and that pain will keep you alert. So at that moment, for whatever reason, I remembered to pinch the palm of my hand and just, you know, just go to the balcony. Remember, why am I here? I'm not here to get into a fight or an argument with the president of Venezuela. Is that really going to advance the situation? So I just bit my tongue, listened and listened and listened to him. And then after half an hour, I mean, President Chavez was someone who could go on for eight hours if he needed to. He'd often have an eight hour TV show. But because I wasn't reacting, you know, I wasn't reacting, just listening, nodding my head and so on. After about half an hour, you know, he finally, I could see his shoulders sank a little bit and he said to me in a kind of weary tone of voice, he said, so Yuri, what should I do? And at that moment, I knew I had an opportunity because that moment, that his mind was open. Uh, before that, trying to art, you know, reason with him or argue with him, you know, would have been like dealing with a stone wall. But at that moment, his mind was open. So I said, "Mr. President, I, I believe the, the entire country of Venezuela needs to go to the balcony." And it was uh, because it was December, just approaching Christmas. The previous Christmas, all the festivities had been canceled. And I said, "Why not just take a truce, a cooling out period? Just." Let's not talk about the conflict. Just, just call off the conflict for two weeks. Let people spend Christmas holidays with their families. And then in January, we can come back and resume the process. He said, that's a great idea. I'm going to announce that in my next speech. And then he said to me, his mood had entirely changed. And he said to me, you know, uh, um, I'm going to travel around Venezuela over Christmas. And uh, I'd love for you to come with me and see the country. And, uh, and then he thought, wait a minute, you're a neutral. Maybe it's not so good for you to you know, be seen in my company all the time. But he said, but no problem, I'll give you a disguise. <laughs> and, uh, but in any case, what I learned from that, what I learned from that was perhaps the greatest power that we have as negotiators is the power not to react. You know, it's the power not to react, to go to the balcony instead. So learning how to go to that balcony is the, is the prerequisite course, negotiation course, I wish I had taken when I was in school because it's, it's something I've learned over the years. It's very important to do. A second obstacle uh, that I mentioned before is, is the lack of genuine understanding of the other. Uh, it's difficult to understand the other. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult. And the key, of course, is to listen. But listening is not easy, and particularly listening in a way that's truly effective. Because when we listen in a dispute, we often listen with the aim of refuting what the other side is about to say, or the other side is saying. Uh, what I'm talking about is listening with the aim of truly understanding what the other side is saying. When we listen, we usually listen within our own frame of reference. So there's part of us saying, I agree with that, I disagree with that. We're always kind of judging it. 
The trick is how do we listen from within the frame of reference of the other party? How do we, in other words, put ourselves in their shoes, understand what it's really like? That doesn't necessarily mean agreeing with them in any way, but it means trying to understand how they see, how, how they see the situation, how they got there. Uh, and it's, it turns out to be key. It's so easy. I find myself even you know, at this stage you know, judging. Like uh, a year ago or so, I was working on the conflict in Syria. And uh, my colleagues and I, and we, we'd begun by carrying out interviews of the parties in Syria on, on both sides of the, of, of the conflict. And we were doing the first set of interviews with uh, Syrian rebel commanders. And we were doing the interviews right on the border of Syria uh, with Turkey. And we, we conducted about, oh, about 15 interviews. Each one was about three hours. And the last interview, the very last interview, was with a young man who was probably you know, late 20s, 30 maximum, probably late 20s, commander of about 2,000 troops and 2,000 fighters. And, uh, and he was like the picture perfect image of what we in the West would consider to be an Islamic fundamentalist terrorist. I mean, he had the beard, everything. He was a Salafi, which means believed in the literal uh, understanding of the Quran. And so on. And I could just, I was just watching from a balcony. I was watching my own prejudice or my own stereotype showing up. And then what was interesting was to watch as I asked him questions, because I asked him, the first question was, you know, was how did you, how did you start, how did you, how'd you get involved in politics? How did you get involved in this fight? He said, well, I was a student in university. And I said, so what were you studying in university? I was studying poetry. Oh, you're right. He says, I come from a line of poets. My father was a poet, my grandfather was a poet, and then he declaimed some beautiful Arabic poetry, which is gorgeous to hear. And then, uh, and then we got into the conversation, and, uh, uh, and it, you know, I was just asking, so at one, one point I asked him, I said, uh, Let's imagine you know the conflict is over. You win. You know your side wins, and so on, and and you're and you're alive still. What would you like to do with your life? He said, "Well, I have a a love in Egypt that I met, and I would love to get together with her and you know and whatever and the family. That would be his thing." But so slowly, slowly, you can just see just you know a human being shows up. And then I asked him. It was very interesting. At the very end of the interview, I asked him, "What's your greatest fear?" Let's imagine you win. It's the day after. You've won. What's your greatest fear for the future of your country, Syria? And he said, well, I can tell you, my greatest fear is the extremists. And I said, well, you, know, you, know, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, he said, he said, because he said, yes, I believe in Sharia law, and I believe in that. He said, but I don't believe that we can impose that by force on people. I believe it has to be the will of the people. And I'm very concerned about the people who want to impose it by force. And then the last question I asked him was, is there any message you'd like to carry back to people in the West? And he said, yes, he said, you know, in the West, you probably see us, you see on television, and, you see, and we're just, a, we're, we're numbers. We're numbers, numbers of people killed, and now it's up to 130, maybe 150,000 people dead. And he said, uh, but just remember that every one of those numbers is a child, a woman, a man, and every one of us has a soul. Please tell them that. So you can imagine at the end of that conversation, you know, where I was, just doesn't mean that I agree with him, but just, just the understanding that you can get by putting yourself in the shoes of another human being, even if you have some kind of prejudice or stereotype in the very beginning. To me, that's key. Uh, because what's behind it also, what listening does is it provides dignity. And uh, as you notice in that business conflict, you know, the two principles were freedom and dignity. And that was certainly true in our interviews in Syria. It was dignity, really, that, uh, that was key. And the easiest way to show respect for the dignity of the other human being is, is to listen genuinely and deeply. Uh, so that kind of listening, listening with respect, to me, is an art that we can all learn. And as far as I know, there are very few of any courses given on listening, even though it's perhaps the most, maybe the, one of the most fundamental skills, core competencies. Uh, so, in, in my book, that would be required, you know, a required course for, for everyone who's interested, really, in, in, in pursuing negotiation, which is, basically means all of us. And, 
The third challenge, and I'll be very quick with this one because I want to allow time for questions, it has to do with the game that we play. You know, the, the game, as in that Brazilian French dispute, it was around positions, you know, and the aim is how to win by defeating the other. And, and it was a game that I tried to shift from a win-lose proposition to one where both sides could actually be genuinely satisfied as they became. And how do you change the game? To me, the, 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 that's one of the great tasks. How do you change the game from adversarial positional negotiation, confrontation, to more of a joint problem-solving exercise? To me, the, the key way to change the game is to change the frame. Uh, it's, to, it's almost like there's a spotlight in the negotiation. The spotlight can be over here on rigid positions or the spotlight can be over here on what are people's underlying interests, what are, their, what are potential options that could meet those interests, what are objective criteria of fairness, and so on. The question is, how do you move that spotlight? Now, if the other side takes an unreasonable position, naturally, we reject it. They make an unreasonable demand, we reject it. But when we reject it, off the bat, what do they usually do? They dig further into their position. So you just kind of reinforce the game. The question is how to move that spotlight and what I find is, you know, the easiest way to move that spotlight, spotlight is to ask really good, I would call them problem-solving questions like, why? What is it actually that you want? Like I asked my client in that Brazilian-French dispute. What is it exactly that you want? What's behind that? Because he told me what he wanted, but really, what do you really want? Uh, or it might be, what if we were to do it another way? Or it might be to ask someone for their advice. There, there are dozens of those kinds of questions that essentially move the spotlight from positions onto interests, onto options that, you know, creative options that can satisfy those interests, uh, basically the methodology of getting to yes. So uh, let me just, if I may, just that, that art of reframing is, an, is, a, is a power that any one of us has. And I'll give you just one example. Um, I was working in the Civil War uh, where one of the challenges was how do we extract the other side from the jungle, guerrilla commander, in order to negotiate with them in a third country. Uh, how do we let them out and get them out of there when the military was trying to kill all those people? And so we, we had to do it in a way that the, the, we had to do, the government had to do it in a way that its own military didn't know about. And the way that it was done was uh, this government official whom I know well and worked with uh, rented a private helicopter he got in the helicopter, there was a Red Cross official who handed over a, uh, the coordinates uh, of where the meeting place was to be. The helicopter then flew to a clearing in the jungle, landed, and then promptly was swarmed out of the jungle by hundreds of AK-47 toting gorillas, uh, about 500 of them as he estimated. So let's imagine you're in Jaime's shoes, he's there in the helicopter and suddenly you got 500 AK-47s aimed at you, what do you do in a situation like that? Well, he had the presence of mind to go to the balcony and then decide, well, what am I going to do, stay in the helicopter? I'm not saying, so he decided to get out of the helicopter, he opened the door of the helicopter, strode up to the guerrilla commander and said, Comandante, I am now placing you under the personal protection of the president. That's a reframe. That's... <laughs> Uh, you know, and the commandante got in the helicopter, they flew off and the negotiations began. But uh, that art of reframing is something that we need in negotiation. Any of us can do it at any time, of change the interpretation, change the picture, basically. And we can do it by asking good questions. So those are the, those are the three skills, I think, that are critical, that were at least helpful to me, that I'd like to pass on. Let me just conclude by saying that Conflict uh, remains, 33 years later, a growth industry. Uh, uh, and the negotiation revolution actually tends to bring more conflict, not less. Understandably, because hierarchies of power tend to bottle uh, conflict, which then comes out in the open as those hierarchies uh, of power give way to networks of negotiation. Democracies, for example, which are more horizontal surface conflicts which is why they, tend, they seem to us so quarrelsome and turbulent. So the goal cannot be uh, and should not be to eliminate conflict because conflict is an inevitable and in fact a useful part of life. 
Few injustices are actually addressed without conflict. So strange as it may seem, the world, I believe, the world needs more conflict, not less. And the challenge is not so much to eliminate that conflict, it's to transform that conflict. It's to change the form of conflict from destructive conflict, like you know, these, these endless lawsuits that my clients and, client and his opponent were engaged in in character assassinations, or wars into constructive conflict through negotiation, for example, and mediation. And uh, I believe that no task actually is more urgent in the world today than to transform destructive conflict into constructive negotiation and cooperation. Because we're living in an age right now of what future anthropologists might one day call the human family reunion. I mean, all 15,000 language groups, all 15,000 tribes, as it were, are now connected thanks to the communications revolution. We're all in touch with each other for the first time perhaps in human evolution. And like many family reunions, it is not all peace and harmony. There's a lot of dissension, there's a lot of jealousy, there's a lot of injustice. There's, and so to me, the, the real challenge that we face is, is how do we change the game of conflict? So if we can do that and if we can pass on core competencies like learning how to go to the balcony, learning how to listen with respect, learning how to reframe the situation, then I believe we have a much better chance to get to yes, even in situations that might seem very difficult. So in the words of the poet Wallace Stevens, and there's a line that he has in his poem that I've always liked, which goes, after the final no, there comes a yes, and upon that yes, the future world depends. So I want to wish you and all of us much success in getting to that yes. Thank you very much. So a couple of frames of reference for us here at Kauta Law. Um, one is creative problem solving and getting to yes are core to our brand. So we're happy to have you with your brand. For those who haven't realized we're giving away the books, um, realize it, you can take one. We have encouraged you um, to pay it forward and we have a number of ways you can turn back your generosity to us at Colorado Law to think about that as well. We also want to encourage the students to reflect on these themes. Um, you'll hear many faculty members here, um, not just those who are most closely connected to the Harvard Negotiation Project, um, Anna Spain and Scott Peppet um, come to mind. Others who teach legal ethics and professionalism, such as Deb Cantrell, uh, who talk in the terms of core competencies and how to frame a situation. But really, this is a project that uh, pervades many of what our faculty are doing. Um, and with that spirit, I'd love to have a student or two offer the first question. Yes, Michelle. Abs yeah, okay, absolutely. Um, uh, I'll give you just one that just sprang to mind right away was in the mid-90s, I and my colleagues worked for some years on trying to bring an end to the war between Russia and Chechnya. And uh, we had a number of meetings, a number of conferences, uh, number of meetings in Russia itself and, and other places and and we failed uh, there the one of the huge issues was was there had been a war uh, the economy was broken all the young men knew was how to fight and they were easily recruitable by bands or even terrorist groups and so on and at that point we realized what we couldn't do was we couldn't persuade the United States and Europe and global institutions like the World Bank to invest in Chechnya at that moment. And, and, a, and the result was the war broke out again. We had, a, we had negotiated a truce. The war broke out again. The president that we were uh, negotiating with the Chechen president was uh, killed uh, by a Russian uh, drone of some kind. And, uh, and and to this day, you know, that, 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 that situation remains very, very uh, ugly. And just, just in terms of 
the lost opportunities there, if I might just mention, just one little lost opportunity is because that war was not prevented and dealt with by the international community as a third side, uh, you might think, okay, what does that have to do with us? But uh, interestingly, one of the lead uh, hijackers on 9-11 uh, was a man who had, sh who, who, had been, who had signed up because of the war in Chechnya. In other words, because of the war in Chechnya, that's why he joined Al-Qaeda. And then tomorrow, if you know, is the first anniversary of the terrorist attack on the Boston Marathon, two Chechen young men. So, in other words, if we don't have, uh, if we don't, as a world, as a global community, take responsibility for serving as a third side to help transform those conflicts, uh, everyone pays the price. Other questions? And I'm not afraid to call on people, so. Yeah. If you could become a negotiator between the United States and Russia, what would you, how would you speak to Mr. Putin? Well, well first of all, um, I, would, I would apply just those three principles that I just uh, was outlining. First thing I would, I'd want to go to the, I think there's an immense need to go to the balcony for both countries uh, because there's a lot of reaction going back and forth. There's a lot of nationalist reaction right now in Russia. There's a lot, I mean, in the press here, there's a lot of talk of Cold War and whatever and just say, whoa, what are, we, what are we trying to achieve here? What do we actually want? So I would ask, you know, one of the things to ask Mr. Putin is, you know, what does he really want? What, what's his real concern? It's not just him. It's uh, his constituency, too, in Russia, because the thing is people are focusing on him, but what he's doing is enormously popular in much, much of Russian sectors. It's not, uh, it's not just, we tend to kind of demonize and look for the demon there. The other thing is, I would go from the balcony, I would look and say, wait a minute, have we truly been listening to understand what is actually going on? What, what's the concern of Russia? Again, it's like, from the, from the news you'd read, it was like, well, this issue just showed up just like last month, right? Uh, I remember actually being called in working for a consultative meeting in, in our government uh, 20 years ago on Crimea uh, at the time when, uh, when the Soviet Union was breaking up and the question was the Crimea and the, and the basis. But, but at that time, at the time that the Soviet Union was breaking up, uh, our leaders made assurances to the Russian leaders that NATO would not be on its borders. And yet, within years, when Russia was weak, we, we ignored those assurances and we put NATO right on its borders. So it's almost as if, how would we feel if the Warsaw Pact was suddenly in Canada and Mexico on our border? What, 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 what would be the response in this, in this country? Uh, and so it's just to try and understand a little bit of what's going on there. And what, because if you understand what's going on, not just for Putin, but I'd say for a lot of Russians, is there is a deep feeling of humiliation, uh, that they were humiliated uh, and certainly not respected. And I think much conflict that I've seen in the world is, you know, what, what is a misguided way to try and recapture self-respect in some ways and collective self-respect. So now we're dealing with a situation where a little bit of prevention 10, 20 years ago could have gone a long way and, and prevented this conflict. Now we're, now we're dealing at a point where it's escalating. Uh, but I think the very first thing we need to do is to remember uh, how important respect is and uh, in, in a situation like this of respect for your adversary, respect for the, the other side. And then I think it's very important to reframe the whole situation and say, whoa, you know, let's, let's look for what's a better question. Is the question now who's going to win this? Is it, you know, are we going to defeat, is the West going to kind of put NATO on the borders of, uh, put Ukraine on the borders of Russia? Or is Russia going to invade the Ukraine in, in, a, in, in, in a nationalistic mood of, you know, of self-protection. And, uh, and so that to me is a real question, but is this, I, I think it's time for, for, for us to reach out to the other side, to acknowledge our part in this whole historical play, and to say, how, how can we create a future in which 
you know, Russia can thrive, the West can thrive, Ukraine can thrive, everyone can thrive. And uh, that's not what I'm seeing right now. What I'm seeing right now is, is, uh, is, um, is just, you're going to pay a price, you're going to pay a price, you're going to pay a price. And the truth is, uh, and, and on the other side, you know, we're going to show them, we're going to show them, we're going to show them. And we all know where that, where that tends to lead. It just leads an escalation into what Mahatma Gandhi called an eye for an eye and we all go blind. Now, did he say that or was that kind of an apocryphal thing that got developed after the fact? Because I saw the movie too. <laughs> and I heard that line, I repeated it, but I wondered, did, did he actually say that? As far as I know, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, 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 I've read it. It's not just in the movie. It's, no, he actually did say that. All right. And he also said, it was interesting, he also said at one point, I don't think it was in the movie, he, when he landed in, uh, in, uh, in England for the first, uh, for, you know, when he was, uh, after his civil disobedience movement, he landed and a reporter asked him, Mr. Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? Gandhi went to the balcony for a moment and he thought, he said, I think that would be a very good idea. <laughs> Dana. I don't know about predictions, but the uh, Rwanda to me is a, again is one of the great tragedies, and and the greatest tragedy would be if we didn't listen, if we didn't listen and learn from that episode that happened 20 years ago. Because I think right now where humanity is is we're just beginning to learn what people are starting to learn in medicine right now that prevention goes a long way. You know, that it's not just about, you know, open heart surgery. What about good diet? And, uh, and Rwanda was a preventable genocide. That's what I think we first need to understand. It was a preventable genocide. Uh, it was played up in the press as kind of people going crazy and killing each other. And that was true. But it was carefully planned months, if not years in advance, by circles within the Rwandan uh, government and, and, and elite at that time. Uh, they were making lists for months in advance of who they were gonna kill. Uh, it was that the, the, the gasoline uh, the, you know, was, was, you know, was orders basically to start killing and then it started getting out of control. But that was known. That was not, that was not a, a secret. That was known by our intelligence agencies. It was known by the French and so on. And even uh, when the bloodshed just began, there was a UN, there was a UN force of peacekeepers there of about a thousand, uh, yeah, I think there was about maybe, there's several thousand peacekeepers. And the general who was in charge, whose name was Romeo Dallaire, made an appeal and said, if you can double my troops, just send a few thousand peacekeepers, I can nip this thing in the bud. And because of a variety of things in Somalia and so on, uh, our government uh, basically said no. Um, not only will we not send troops, but we're not going to allow anyone else to send troops either. Uh, and you know, at the UN, they you know they they blocked it. Uh, and so, to me, I mean, it would have. I mean, in other words, what it would have taken at that moment was for the U.S. to provide some of our large planes because there's a air force, there's a uh, air, uh, there's a base. Uh, 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 an airport right near Rwanda in Entebbe in Uganda to bring those, those troops. Romeo Dallaire later, there was a conference some years afterwards in which his claim that he could have maybe stopped this genocide was put to the test and their whole group of scholars and policy analysts and they, just, they, they actually uh, supported him and said yes, there was a very good chance that he could have stopped it. So the lesson we need to learn is prevention. And now to come back to your question of how do you, how do, you do that, to me Rwanda is an amazing case uh, it's not perfect by any means, but of amazing amount of, of experiments in reconciliation, in using restorative justice, for example, uh, in women's leadership uh, in reconciliation. Uh, it, it leaves a lot to be desired, but it's, those are the, we need to learn both from how to prevent the Rwandan genocide, and then how do you, how do you deal with those, those traumas 
when people that you know have killed your wife or husband or children or parents, how do you begin to forgive? How do you begin to, uh, to move? How do, you, how do you begin to forgive without forgetting? And to me, we can, we can learn a lot of lessons from Rwanda. Time for one last question. Yeah, Ian. Well, uh, I th first of all, I believe you can. And what I would say is, uh, you, know, you know, you can call truces. You can have, you know, I mean, essentially, I think we're in the infancy of devising methods of dispute resolution that can work at various levels from families all the way up to, to, to nations. And we're beginning to learn different ways of doing it. A good example is you know, learning from the example in South Africa, for example, where, which was, a, a, again, another conflict where you know, uh, I, and I can see at least one colleague here in the, off, in, in the room here, you know, were there working at, at different times or witnessing what was going on. But it, it, was, it was an experiment. It was an amazing experiment because at that point, most people around the world believed that there would be bloodshed between black and whites in, in South Africa for as long into the future as you could imagine. And yet, there was, it was extremely difficult, but through, it wasn't just uh, amazing charismatic leadership of Nelson Mandela, who was just astonishing as a leader, but uh, it, there was a whole movement that, that actually mobilized the entire nation, going to your question. There was something called the National Peace Accord, where they had peace committees operating uh, at the national level down to the kind of the neighborhood block level where you would have not just blacks and whites, you have poor and rich people sitting around saying, how can we transform this conflict? How can we stop the violence that was going on during the peace process so as to allow a free and fair election to proceed? And it was the mobilization of those sectors of society, law professors, law students, women's groups, labor unions, churches, all gathered together mobilizing, and we need to learn uh, from those examples, uh, there was a, a professor, a noted professor of peace studies here at CU for many years, noted economist Ken Boulding, who used to like to say, what exists is possible. And in my lifetime, I can say, when I started working on conflict, for example, uh, back with Roger Fisher and, and others at the Harvard Negotiation Project, you know, we were working on South Africa, and people said that was impossible. We were working on the Cold War. People said, there's going to be a Berlin Wall there for generations to come. Uh, we we're working on, on Northern Ireland. People said, the Catholics and Protestants will kill each other you know, forever. And yes, there are still many conflicts in the world, but we can learn from those conflicts which everyone had thought were impossible and intractable and yet yielded over time to patient, persistent negotiation and that challenge of learning starts right here in, in these kinds of classes, which you take here at, at CU Law School, because what we need is a whole new generation. And we need to bring the creativity of, that we put into devising better forms of software and to new apps, into new apps for human relationships, for dealing with, with families and nations at that level. And we're just at the beginning of that. And so I invite any of you who care to participate in this adventure, we need you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, Bill, like I said, four questions. Um, the spirit and inspiration you've offered here pervades how we're approaching this project. And here you have people from our community, alums, faculty, staff, and students, all to be re-inspired by you. Um, for some more inspiration, I'd encourage mixing. And those of you who are not students, please spend time with the students here uh, in next door. Uh, they can use your guidance inspiration. It's really a team effort here at Colorado Law. And so, um, Bill, thank you for being part of our team and joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.